The spinal cord is an absolutely vital part of your nervous system. It carries electrical information to and from your brain. It allows you to feel what's going on in your hands and feet, move your arms and legs, keep you breathing and ultimately keeps you alive. Damage to it can result in loss of sensation and both voluntary and involuntary function of huge swathes of your body. It can be a life-changing injury. I'm going to talk to you about how the spinal cord can be injured, some ways that we can tell you how it's been injured, how we diagnose it in the hospital, and finally cover some of the treatment options that are available. So how can the spinal cord be injured? Damage to the spinal cord can occur in lots of different ways, but most often it involves trauma. Road traffic accidents and falls are the most common. Sometimes it can involve a slip disc pressing on the spinal cord or a fractured vertebra, either damaging or pushing on the spinal cord itself. If any of these terms don't sound familiar, we've got a video you can watch to teach you about the basic building blocks of the spine. Click up here. Other less common causes include infection or ischemia, which is when spinal cord tissue dies due to a lack of blood flow. Tumors can also cause a spinal cord injury. Just over half of all spinal cord injuries occur in the cervical spine or in the neck. So, once a patient comes into hospital, we need to assess them clinically and figure out how bad the damage is. There are all sorts of checklists and prognostic tools that we use in surgery, and in spinal cord injury, it's usually graded using the American Spinal Injury Association Impairment Scale commonly and thankfully referred to as the Asia score. Whilst this helps us in terms of understanding the total impact of the injury on function, symptoms can vary depending on the location of the damage. Some of the more common types are called incomplete injuries because not all of the spinal cord is damaged and there's still some function left. These include central cord syndrome, which we'll cover in another video, anterior cord syndrome, brown saccade syndrome, and conus medullaris syndrome. Most common incomplete spinal cord injuries and even complete ones occur from over flexing the neck in young people, which is like that, and overextending the neck in the elderly. More commonly damaged, we aren't going to discuss the corda equina, which is the horsetail like bundle of nerves branching off below the spinal cord, just for streamlining purposes, but we will cover it in another video. Lastly, it should be noted that complete spinal cord injury is the most drastic of all injuries, since by definition neither your motor nerves, which are responsible for movement, or sensory nerves, responsible for feeling, can communicate with the brain at all. This usually arises from a very significant traumatic event, and these can be severe accidents or penetrating injuries such as gunshots, and that's associated with the worst Asia scores. So in order to do in some investigations and get some diagnoses, we need to do a full neurological examination, and that tells us exactly where the function and the sensation has been lost. Since your body's skin territories and muscle groups correspond to particular nerves, that come from the spine, examination can help us identify the spinal level where the injury has occurred, especially if imaging is not immediately available. The information can all plug into the Asia score. In the end though, imaging is essential to assess the damage. A CT scan and an MRI helps to collate a series of images of the region, vital for determining the exact sites of injury, the extent of any blood vessel damage, fractures, bruising, loss of cerebrospinal fluid from the spinal canal. If we can identify where and what is causing someone's symptoms, then we can plan the best course of action or treatment. So what's this treatment going to revolve around? Managing a spinal cord injury depends on its mechanism and its location. If it's been caused by trauma, for example, immobilization of the spine as soon as possible is vital in most cases, along with either conservative or surgical correction of any additional spinal injuries. Likewise, if it's in a certain location, the actual surgical procedures used to fix the damage might be different. Surgical correction typically involves removing any blood, fragments of disc that are putting pressure on the spinal cord and the nerves. Commonest of such procedures is known as a decompression or a laminectomy, but after that sometimes screws and rods might need to be put in to scaffold and stabilise the spine. Any compressive damage caused by tumours may involve an operation to remove them. So, 
Once we fix the problem, surgically or not, if it's required, the next step is spinal rehabilitation. And this is complex and it's different for each individual patient. It's essential that you and the team looking after you have got clear goals set between you to help to achieve the best outcomes for you especially as you move forward after surgery, for example. Rehabilitation is multidisciplinary. Doctors will often discharge you to a team of specialists who supply pain relief and are focused on relieving nerve pain or providing laxatives to help you open your bowels if you've lost control of that. Your recovery would be treated with both physical and psychological components taken into account. Physical therapists will work on your mobility with you. That involves using walking aids, perhaps even low-level electrical stimulation to help muscles readjust after the injury. Occupational therapists will work on the function of upper limbs and how well you can use them to do normal activities, such as cooking, eating, cleaning yourself. They'll help you create living quarters in a space where you're well supported and are at low risk of further injury. Lastly, specialist rehab nurses will help move you to stop you developing pressure sores, which can affect up to a quarter of chronic spinal cord injury patients. If loss of bladder or bowel control is present, they'll also help monitor these functions so you don't have accidents and infections can be minimized. Psychologists can help you with any emotional or behavioral concerns, whilst speech and language therapists can help you with swallowing and communication should there be any difficulties with those. Finally, case and social workers act as a bridge between each specialist groups to streamline your care. So, final notes. Spinal cord injury is a beast with many faces. Positive outcomes cannot be guaranteed even after surgery. Should be noted though that for incomplete injuries treated swiftly with appropriate high quality rehab, people can have major improvements up to 18 months later. For those with more severe injuries, outcomes can be a bit more bleak. But once again, with appropriate medication, rehabilitation and support, there's no reason that patients can't still salvage a decent quality of life regardless. This video was commissioned and supported by the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma, whose aim is to create better neurotrauma care across the world and especially in low to middle income countries. There are going to be more videos talking about diagnosis, treatments, prognoses as well coming up. So do make sure you like, subscribe and follow the channel. See you next time.